This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Think like, okay, God, like there's all this pressure. I gotta make the right decision. I gotta make, I gotta, I gotta go to the right grad school. I have to get the right job. I have to do the right thing. There, there is no right thing. Right? There's just a path that you're going to go on that's going to lead you to the next path, and the path after that, and the path after that. If you want to start a business, do it now. If you want to work in real estate, do it now. If there's something that's meaningful in your life that's worth pursuing, pursue it now. The center is the customer. They're the ones who are paying for everything. I just saw this as, oh my god, this is like my chance. A quarter of a million dollars, it was almost surreal. You can't just cut out one person in the supply chain in order to solve the problem. Those are the kind of people you want. You respect them, their integrity, their intelligence, their ability, their can-do attitude, hard work. All right, welcome back to the Spring 2015 Distinguished Lecture Series here at UC Santa Barbara. Um, I, as always, I want to thank our sponsor, by Nick Fowler, Fowler, Archibald, and Spray, for without whom we wouldn't be here. Uh, great startup lawyers here on the Central Coast in um, California, and um, really adding a lot of value to our community, but also here to, uh, at the university as well. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. It's very, very simple. It's my name at John Greathouse, never tweeting about rainbows, butterflies, or kittens, I promise. So we have Jason Nazar with us tonight. Jason is an amazing guy. He's a friend and an extremely accomplished entrepreneur. He was the co-founder and CEO of DocStock. DocStock was recently acquired by Intuit, and we'll, we will talk uh, quite a bit about that. DocStock's mission is to provide the best quality and widest selection of documents to start grow and manage a, an, a small business for entrepreneurs. So a great service that he's providing to the entrepreneurial community. He's also the, uh, he also has his own show. I'm really nervous because Jason has interviewed so many, so many um, high profile people um, and I'm just an amateur at this. So uh, I can't wait to get him up here on the stage. He hosts the Startups Uncensored, which is a widely watched, wide, um, widely um, um, participated event in Southern California, and I invite all of you guys to uh, come down and check out his show. It's a great event. It's the longest running and most widely attended technology gathering in Southern California. Before he started DocStock, Jason was a venture partner, um, a, a partner in a venture consulting firm in Los Angeles, and that gave him a chance to look at dozens of different companies, sort of see what was working, what wasn't working, what really got him interested and excited about business, and what, quite frankly, uh, were the things that didn't excite him. He also has the distinction of being the class president of both his undergraduate as well as his graduate school. He went to a little known undergraduate called UC Santa Barbara, where he was the class president here. Uh, then he went on to Pepperdine, where he earned a joint MBA and JD degree, uh, MBA degree, excuse me, and he was also the class president at Pepperdine while he was there, as if he wasn't busy enough. He's a journalist. He writes for the Wall Street Journal and Forbes, among other uh, uh, publications, and to, I think in 2014 he had one of the most popular articles on Forbes, millions and millions and millions of uh, views, and it was about you guys here in the room as well as many of you that are watching this on your computers. It was about people in their 20s, so hopefully we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about that article, which is still getting tweeted and shared, and I think it, um, Jason was telling me over 250,000 shares of that article alone. Unbelievable. He's been named the most, one of the most admired CEOs in Los Angeles, um, but he's most proud of his three-point shot, and it says his, his ping pong skills, but I think he means his beer pong skills. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm reading into that a little bit because I know the guy. Um, what I'm most impressed by out of all those accolades, all those accomplishments, is he's the only startup CEO that I know who was also a professional hypnotist. Wonderful married man, soon to be a family man. I try to bring folks in here that are successful personally and professionally. If you guys have ever heard the word mensch, if you've ever heard that word and wondered what a mensch is, you are about to meet a mensch. Let's welcome Jason. All right. 
So I want to know, why weren't you the class president of your high school? No, I wasn't popular enough. Hey, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you all. You're not running for office. Be quiet. No. I'm no. answering. And, and I forgot to wear my pink shirt and brown corduroy, so <laughs> that My wife well. loves these shorts. Yeah. A combination. I'm gonna make her watch this. Oh. She's like, corduroy should not be made into shorts. It's for cold, it's for cold weather. Like, uh, get with it. <laughs> so, what drove you to be the class president here at, at Santa Barbara, and then as well as at Pepperdine? And talk about some of the things you learned in that process, because um, you and I have had a chance to talk about this in the past, and you learned a ton. Some of which you didn't even realize at the time you were gonna use later. So. Open any question, go. Absolutely. I'm going to get to that in a minute. Oh! Uh, I'm going to try to make. This is not your show. No, no. I'm, I'm going to try to make this afternoon as little bit about me as possible, as much about you. And so I'll reference a couple things that you know have happened personally in my life. But I'm going to try to apply them to you. And I actually have one goal. My one goal is I got a, I got a bunch of backseaters on the internet. And my goal is to beat the internet, right? So if I can be more interesting than everything in the world, for about 30 minutes, I'll know that I did a good job. So no pressure. Keep the, keep the laptops open. Keep your phones out. It's totally OK. But if, if I, at some point, see your eyes move off the laptops and off your phones onto me, I'm like, hey, I, I beat the internet today. That was a good deal. Uh, it, so 99, 2000, I was a class president here. And uh, it started as a joke. I was not that you know super popular guy on campus. And I was involved in AS because I ran a program where I brought folks, called Family Literacy, I brought folks, students on campus in Tile La Vista to help um, the families get extra reading help for their kids. And uh, all these people were running, and it was, it was, you know, it was the start of political parties on the campus. Uh, and I, as a joke, told somebody in AS that I was going to run for president. And I got home that day, and I started thinking, uh, well, why not? Why, why shouldn't I? Why, why wouldn't I? And uh, that's actually been a pretty powerful mantra in my life since then, and, and one that you know, we'll talk a little bit about, which is you know, somebody's going to do something big and important, whether it's here on campus or in the business field or in politics or in science, and, and why shouldn't it be any of you? And why should you think that somebody else is more qualified or better? And so it started as a joke. But I ended up you know, working really hard at it. Admittedly so, I, I really did not go to any class for about two and a half months Don't whatsoever. Tell him that part. Yeah. <laughs> I think he said he went to all of his, what was that? Yeah. No, I, I didn't go to any class. And, and one of the things I will, encourage, <laughs> I will encourage a lot of you to do is to spend less time studying and spend less time on your academics. Because at some point, there's diminishing returns. At some point, whether you get the A minus or the B plus, it really doesn't make any difference for your life whatsoever. But the couple hours that you put into um, maybe trying to start a business or doing an internship or just getting involved with lots of people on campus and clubs are probably going to make a much bigger difference in your life. And so I just threw myself into that process. And uh, one of the big things that I learned there, which kind of we'll call it lesson number one, is uh, let's get other people to do stuff for us. So probably the biggest reason that I won that year, and it was a crazy runoff, and it was a tie, and then it went to a runoff, is that um, I had a whole kind of army of people, both in my fraternity and that I knew throughout school, that I got them excited about what I was doing, what I was running for president, and I got them to really go out and spread the word. And, and that's a big part about leadership. That's a big part about business, which is you got to be able to motivate and excite other people to want to do things for you by bringing them in, by telling a story, by making people part of something. And if, if folks feel like they're part of something, and even if you're the driver or if you're the main beneficiary of it, uh, that's, a, that's a really good trade off for a lot of folks. Because a lot of folks don't want to step up and be the number one and yep. take on all the pressure and all the responsibility, but they want to be part of something. And so if, if we collectively can help people be part of something, we can often get outsized personal advantages for that. Yep. Well, I like, there's a couple things that I got out of that. One is you're all in. You're like me in that regard. Like, if you're going to do it, you're going to do it. Like, you're not going to kind of run. You're going to run. And maybe not go to as much class as you should have. The other thing, um, you weren't afraid to fail publicly. I mean, that's something that, you know, that kind of separates certain um, entrepreneurs from other people is, a lot of times when you put yourself out there, it's quite public. Um, and you have to be OK with maybe it's not going to work out the way you, you hoped, but you're going to learn a lot in the, pro in the process. You would have learned everything that you did learn, whether you won that election or not. 
The fact that you won didn't change what you learned on that journey. Now, you learned a lot of other stuff once you got the office, but people forget that, right? It's like it's really about the learning process along the way, not whether you cross the finish line first or not. So you are the king of mentoring. I think you are. And you called yourself a mentor whore. Thank you. I didn't want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> because you had so many freaking mentors. So what I'd love to hear from you, and then that, that came in handy with DocStock. We'll get to it in a minute. But what I'd like to hear from you is how, what are tips and tricks for, for folks that are looking to get mentors? And what mistakes do you think you made now that you're a little bit older and you're like, oh my gosh, I didn't get it at the time, but I probably shouldn't have said that to that person. Mentoring. Yeah, so let's, let's, we'll get to that, but let's talk about the why of it first of all, right? So why bother to get mentors? Why bother to even care about any of that? Uh, how, many, how many of you uh, either, how many of you would like to have a job after you finish college? All right, this is pretty, pretty safe, pretty safe survey. Uh, your ability to get a job, especially at this point of your lives, drastically depends upon who you know and very little depends upon what you know. Yep. Yet, here you all are spending the majority of your time on what you know. I guarantee you outside of your social lives, the number one thing that takes up your time right now is going to class and studying. And that's all the what to know. What you're probably not spending time on, on is the who you know. And the who you know is what's gonna determine if you get a job, it's gonna determine if you get a great job, it's gonna determine if you can get a business off the ground, and I don't know what it was, but I kind of figured out that formula early on. And more than figure it out, I really applied it. And so I, in college, but specifically really in grad school, uh, would probably set up two to three meetings a week with people I didn't know. And I'd say, hey, um, I, I don't want anything. I'm just a student. But I would love to come pick your brain, ask some advice. And then if there's anything I could do to help you out, I would love to do that. And I did that consistently for about four years. So we're talking you know, probably about 150 to 200 meetings I had. And the reason I was a, a mentee whore is that at the end of every single one of these meetings, I said, hey, you know, would you consider being my mentor? No. Right? Um, <laughs> and consistently, every single person says yes. N nobody says no, right? You have to have a dried up, shriveled heart. You have to hate babies and puppies. <laughs> you know, you just have to, you know. It, you, everybody says yes to wanting to be your mentor. And then what it does is it creates this really weird relationship where that person goes home to their spouse. They're like, this, I, I'm somebody's mentor. Like, they feel responsible for your life's outcome, right? And so they're more apt to answer your emails, your phone calls if you ask for help. And, and here I was, and I did this across 150 people. Right, and so little did they know that there was this incestuous mentoring happening. Right, I was a polygamous mentee. <laughs> Yet, uh, let's talk about something super practical, right? A lot of these people I took those meetings with and that I asked to be my mentor ended up becoming angel investors of mine when I was still in grad school and had built the first version of DocStock and was out of money. And so to me, it had a very real tangible effect that it turned into three quarters of a million dollars that then helped me raise venture capital that really helped the company go in. And had I not built up that network, and had I not known those people, I don't know that I'd be hanging out with you here today. And so more important than the specifics, right, of how you go about mentoring, yep, like, yep. I, I think that's secondary. The, the main thing is our success very much comes from who we know, and very little often comes from what we know, unless you're a real, real specialist in something, right? If, if you're going to a, a, a heart surgeon, you probably don't you know, give an F who they know. You're like, are you going to amputate my heart correctly? Right, that's a situation where what you know is pretty darn important. But if you're an entrepreneur and you're not a specialist in anything but a generalist in lots of areas, who you know is extremely important. And so th that's the main thing I would yeah. say a takeaway. And, and what I would encourage all of you to start doing is, is building up that professional network of yours starting today. Spend some time each week, each month, uh, to meet more people and then, and then build those relationships. And, and that should, in many cases, it's going to sound odd, but be more than the time that you spend on your classwork. Right? There, college is a great end in itself. Just to be here and to learn and enjoy is great, and that's worth a lot of time. But the time that you're spending on classes and the time that you're spending on work is not going to help you get a job, and it's not going to help you start a business. 
And so the sooner you realize that, the sooner you're going to set yourself up for more professional success. Yep, and we started this speaker series in the fall with my mentor. And we talked about mentoring. And he talked about how he acquired mentors over the years. And when I've told the students consistently, as well as people that are watching this, that is one of the two correlating factors to success after college. Did you have a job while you were in college that was relevant to your field that you wanted to go into? And did you have a mentor? So get on it. Come on, you guys. I still get emails from students that say that class that you had back in the fall encouraged me to go ahead and get a mentor. So some of them are, are, are um, carrying out that strategy. So you were, went and got a joint MBA, JD, pretty conventional path, right? Um, how did you balance this, this obvious drive that you're an entrepreneur with the, the desires that your family had for you? And the reason I ask this question is one of the things I try to impart on my students is the road to happiness is to live the life you want to live, not the life other people want for you. But at the same time, you have to be respectful of those people that love you and are around you. How did you balance that desire that was in your heart versus what other people wanted you to do with that law degree? Yeah. So in, in my case, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you can relate, there were, there were a lot of specific pressures. Um, I, I'm half Middle Eastern. I have a Persian Jewish father. And so it was like, OK, you can be a doctor or a lawyer. This is, these are the two. <laughs> and really, both of those were just something to do until it was time for me to help him with the real estate business. And so there were always a lot of expectations. I've met his dad. That's true. Yeah. So I mean, my, uh, you know, the first couple years out of uh, undergrad, I decided I, I really didn't want to be in law school at that time. And he's like, you're wasting your life. You are a bum. This is what you are doing. <laughs> and this was every conversation every day, <laughs> right? So in terms of expectations, they were certainly there. Uh, you know, I think that the fact that there are people that love you that have expectations for your success is a great thing, right? There's a lot of people that don't have that, and that's a real thing that they're missing out. And so I, would, I think that's always an awesome thing to have people that love you, that want to be successful, and the fact that they're maybe projecting their model sure. success onto you is OK, because people are going to do that your entire life. I think what's important is to, is to follow your heart of what is really going to make you happy and is, going to, and is going to get you the goals that you want, not just now, but in the long term, right? And so part of it is that you don't know. Um, but if, if I had to do it all over again and I was having this talk with the entrepreneurship group, I, I wouldn't have got the JD MBA, not because it wasn't a great experience and I use that information all the time and it's been really helpful for me, but I would have just started more businesses. And if, if I could have done this all over again, I would have tried to start something like DocStock right where you all are right now. The fact is, I didn't feel ready when I was 19, 20, 21 to start any kind of business that was more than just about me. And if you even look at the first and second business I started, they were service companies. So they're just things that I knew how to do that I got people to pay me for. I would try to completely redo that model because you you never know enough. You never get to a point where it's like, oh, you know, I've figured out enough now that now I know what to yep. do for a business. And so I would encourage all of you to think about your 20s as five times at bat. And I don't know how many of you here want to start a business, or let's say it's a third or half or whomever it is. But if you do, my, my biggest point of view is start now, start early. Because if you try to start your first business from 20 to 22 and it doesn't work out, and you do it again from 22 to 24 and so on and so on, I guarantee you, by the time that you're 30, not only will you have found one that was probably successful, but one that's going to build a great life for you. And all that time that you spend is going to be so worthwhile. And I'm not saying that you have to start a business. That's not the path for everybody. And like I said, you should do whatever is passionate and meaningful and rewarding for you, both personally and professionally and financially. But I, I, that's how I look at my 20s. And Whenever somebody in your position comes to me and says, hey, you know what, I, I, I want to be in entrepreneurship, there's only one conversation we have, which is start now. Because there'll never be a time that you'll be ready. And there, really what happens now is, is um, you know, you're jumping off a, tri a tightrope that's you know, a foot off the ground. You have nothing, nothing to lose, and everything to gain. And you will see as people get into their mid-20s, you start to see your friends make a little bit of money, and then they get a nice car. It's like, well, I want a nice car now. And they start to buy more expensive clothes. I'm like, I want more expensive clothes. 
And then as you get into your 30s, people are buying houses and having kids. It's like, okay, well now I'm gonna do this. And all of a sudden, you have all these things that make it really hard and difficult to start a business. And forget even starting a business. I cannot even tell you the number of people that I interviewed for various positions in DocStoc where I was saying, look, I'm gonna ask you to take 10% less than your market salary, but you're gonna get all this equity here that could turn into a lot of money one day. And a lot of people weren't even willing to do that because it's like, well, I got a mortgage, I got my bills, I can't take 10% less than what I would normally make. And they probably missed out on making a lot of money with us or with other companies in the same situation. And, and those are real pressures. And what happens is more and more time goes on, you just inherently feel like I have more to lose. And in some way you do, there, there's more complication. But none of you have anything to lose right now. All you have to do is gain. This is the absolute best time to start a venture because there's nowhere to go but up. And if you work on it for two years and it doesn't work out, and even if you go $40,000 in the debt, those two years spent are gonna be more meaningful and more valuable than going to grad school and spending twice as much money in student loans in that same amount of time. And it's the best education you'll ever give yourself. And so it, it's one of these things that unfortunately you, you only know after time. And so I can say this and, and I'll be like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And some of you leaning in, it's like, okay, it really gets it. But I'm telling you, out of the 100 X people in here, their room, maybe one or two of you are gonna get out, of, really get this and walk out of this room and really go start something and really go focus on it. And, and, and honestly, you're the one or two that I'm here for today. Like I like all of you, you're all nice and pretty and pleasable and everything. And whether you're on your computer or not, I still love you. But I, I'm actually only here today for one or two of you. And I don't know which one or two it is. And, and I won't know after this, but I'll know in five years. I'll know in five years when one of you sends me an email out of the blue and says, you know what? I didn't even come up to you that day, Jason, but what you said really got to me. I started spending more time working on that thing. I didn't waste time. I didn't wait until I was 25. I started it now. And I've got this great business that helps people and supports my life. And I'm actually pretty successful. And I just wanted to say thank you. And that's when I'll know. And so I'm here today to see who, which one of you I'm talking to in five years from today. I think there's probably five or six people going to watch us online as well. So you might get seven emails. <laughs> Come on, guys, let's make it eight emails. No, I think there's a lot more than a couple of people in here that Jason is touching. And there are a lot of people that are going to see this online. As you know, it's a long tail. And um, it's an inspiring message. I mean, it's absolutely We're going to translate true. into 150 languages. Hey, we've got Google doing that yeah. even as we speak. Yeah. So we'll subtitle it as well. So I'm going to go to the student question in a second. Um, but let's, let's keep on talking about your journey. So you're, you're getting this MBA. You got the pressure from your, your dad to be a lawyer and then come help with the family business. Yet you're playing around with DocStock. Um, and you end up doing the service business because you know how to be a consultant and you're obviously a great salesman. When did you or what, what kind of led you to say, screw it, I'm doing DocStock. Like, this is what I'm doing. It was pretty similar to uh, the why not me moment in, in college. And so I... I was running this consulting business with my closest friend in the MBA program, and I had had the idea in 2006 that there should be something like YouTube for documents, right? There should be a platform where all of us can upload our documents to one place on the internet, and then other people can get those things, whether they're legal forms or class notes or business documents or financial models, whatever they were. And uh, I just started building it out. And when I first started building it out, it felt like a project. And I had mentally budgeted. I had almost $20,000 in savings, right? So I was super rich. <laughs> and I said, you know, I'll spend up to $5,000 on this. And, and that was the mindset I went into. I called it a project, and it was something I was mentally willing to spend $5,000 on. And a couple months in, I had spent all my savings. I had taken credit card debt out. And I was fortunate enough to not, up to that point, having had to take out student loans. And I took out student loans. That until I sold DocStock, I was still paying back. And, and I was just in it. And then there was no other choice. I, I, was, I was there in it. And I was like, wow, like, I am fully invested in this. I have no way out. I'm either going to make this a success or not. Yep, yep. And, and that's how it happens a lot of time. You, don't, you, just, you have to jump in. And, and once you jump in, you realize, you know, it's like uh, my uh, 
four-year-old nephew, right? He finally learned to, like, we tried to get him to swim in every way. He just wouldn't go, and he would cry. He hated the water, da da. And finally, we took him to some, you know, woman in the in the valley that was called the swim the, the swim Nazi, and she's like, "Okay, it's your turn to swim," and just throws him in. <laughs> and then he got out, and he was crying, and he just throws him in again. <laughs> and and if I could, you know, actually metaphorically or literally, if I could literally do that to each one of you for entrepreneurship, I would, because once you're in it, you just you just you find a way. You find a way to, to make it work in many times, in many cases. Not every case, but again, when, when we're at this stage of life, when you're at the stage of life you're in, you get to try it again and again and again. And so until you just jump in, until you, until you say that you're going to do it, right, um, you know, you, you're never going to. Well, you, let's just take the first question. I was going to go with one more, but since you're, you're on a roll. I heard about... Uh, your, you know, supposed mentee whoring, and and I kind of took that to heart. But um, in doing so, I found it really hard to kind of keep track of all the people I was meeting. And you know, sometimes you'd meet somebody who's a really, 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 you know, powerful and helpful mentor, and then things just pile up, and you might lose track of you know their time, and they they kind of feel betrayed in that sense. You know, do you have any tips for keeping in touch with and you know managing you know the information you get and the time of your mentors? So how did you manage your 287 mentors? I, I skipped a lot of class, <laughs> and, I, and I didn't you know, spend as much time studying as other people. Uh, I'm going to expand upon this. The very simple answer is you just prioritize it, and you find different reasons to reach out to people. Hey, here's this article I thought was, was interesting that you thought, I thought you might like. Send them a text. Oh, I saw you, know, you came up in a Google News Alert. That was really cool. Uh, here's something that I'm working on. Can we get together again for coffee? You, you just make the time for it. And, Opening up a relationship doesn't mean anything unless you maintain and, and give to that relationship. Right. And the simplest thing is to be authentic, to be meaningful, and try to do things to help other people. So probably the reason that John says, OK, I'm a mensch, is I just have a philosophy in life that if you help a lot of people out without any specific intent of, of want of what you want back right from them, it, it all comes around. right? It, it will genuinely all come around. and. Um, you know, I had started this consulting business with um, a, my closest and first friend in business school, Mike Sheridan, right? And you know, there, after going at it for about a year, he was just under too much financial pressure. He needed to leave. I was like, look, no problem. We're building up this business. It's kind of, it was kind of a punch in the gut, not from him, but just situationally that this business we were building, we were going to need to stop because he got offered another job as a VC. And it, was, and it worked out. And then years later, we, after staying friends, and I had had him as a board member, I hired him as the COO of the company. And he really helped change it. And you know, just talking about things coming around, we had gotten this crazy letter from the government that they thought that like, we had stolen all this information. And it was, it was content that other people had uploaded. But there were these government agencies really upset at us. You know, and, and Mike happened to know somebody in these agencies. And like, oh, no problem. You're working with Mike Sheridan. It's all good. Right? And, it's, it's hard. It was actually a big deal, right? It was something that could have majorly disrupted our business, even though you know, we weren't doing anything wrong. And it's just one of those moments. It's like, wow, like, karma is a real thing. Like The odds that he knew the right people that could have just cleared up the whole thing without a year or two of hassle was really infinitesimally small. And it, it just kind of it kind of just comes around. And so the, the big thing there is just try to meet lots of people, try to help them out, and it will come back to you if you spend time with the good, right people. The, the more important and the bigger lesson from it is that, you know, again, 90% of your success will not come from what you know, but from just who you are as a person. Right? The folks that excel in their professions, whether it's the partners at the law firms or the heads of entertainment agencies or the folks that go on to be CEOs, they are not the smartest ones in the company. They are not the most technically proficient. They are not the ones that know the most in many cases. They are the folks that are the most well-liked, that are the best communicators, that are the best people folks. And those are the skills that are really going to make all the difference in your lives and your professional career. Yet, here we are, and we don't spend any of our time deliberately trying to get better at it. In fact, it sounds weird, right? Like, if you're going to go to a class in computer science, OK, whatever, I got to do it. 
But if I said, you're going to go to a class with me afterwards that's voluntarily on leadership skills, it's like, well, that's not cool. Like, who does that? Who's going who's to deliberately spend time trying to get to be a better person? But those are the folks that you all are going to end up working for one day. And so you can either decide today that you're going to really focus on making yourself the best person possible in how you deal with other people, or you're going to end up working for one of those folks eventually. And it's, it's a pretty simple equation, and yet we get it wrong most of the time, right? We, we get it wrong that we think like, oh, if I just do what I do really well, then I'll always be rewarded for it, where it's not the case. It's the folks that can galvanize a lot of people that always have the most success. Well, the te teaching in general is an archaic institution, right? We, it's a little bit of the mass production model. You take a test to prove that you were listening or that you did the reading. And again, it's not really the skills necessarily that you're taking out, in to, certainly not in today's world. So I mean, Bob York is here. Bob York has up the program. I think we're actually changing that. So some of our classes, we're talking about the alchemist. We're talking about what are the real skills that you need to be successful in business. And maybe it's not being the best coder or the smartest accountant or you know, fill in the blank. So I'm, I'm totally with you on that. I think we're trying to change our program to fit that reality, That's which right. I think is why it's popular and That's doing right. well. Now, I, I, here's one thing I can promise you, OK? No one is ever going to ask you what you got as your GPA in undergrad. So you, they, they may for grad school. That, 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 that's the one exception. No one you ever go on an interview will ask you your GPA. No one will ever ask you how much you academically excelled. What they will want to see is how, what, what your communication skills are like, what work you've done that's applicable to that position, how you're going to get along with the folks in the office. No one will ever, ever, ever ask you in a professional context what your GPA was. And so pretty much all the time you spend worrying about it and having anxiety and all the BS around it, throw it away. Because it's not serving you in any way for your professional future. I was going to make a smart remark, but I won't. No, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on that entirely. If you're going for a, you know, a master's program or something like that, certainly grades are going to matter there. But if you're going yeah. for entrepreneurship, Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Or if, Steven, if you if you want to work in tech, I mean, I let me drive the point home. I purposely don't like hiring MBAs because they're like, oh, well, I've got an MBA, right. I've got a master's in business. I'm right. like, well, that doesn't mean anything. Right. Do you know how to do a wireframe on a product? No. Okay. I'll see you later. <laughs> right. And so the most important thing is wherever you want to work, whether it's for an industrial manufacturing company or you want to do real estate investment or you want to go on technology, you have to have to have applicable experience. I will happily hire a motivated, driven 21-year-old who has experience in the thing that I need to get done in my company over a 30-year-old with an MBA who got a 4.0 from Harvard and got you know, his MBA at wherever. Right? It doesn't matter to me. Right? I care about the young, enterprising student who she had experience in the job field that I was talking about and is driven and has good people skills. That's who I want on my team, and those are the people that I've consistently hired over the past decade. And you and I have written about that, how MBAs, it's just, they're just typically not, I mean, we're both MBAs, by the way, and we're both entrepreneurs, but typically they're not well suited for the startup lifestyle. What's it like now that you're on the other side of this mentor thing and you have people approaching you to be a mentor? How are you? Are you, do you have 5,000 mentees, or how is that working out for you? You're a high profile person. I assume you get approached by a lot of people. I, I, a fair amount, and, and part of it is because I write and do the events, so and becoming a you know, semi in tech public figure. Uh, I, I think what's interesting is here, here's a very simple piece of business advice I can share, which is you know, in relationships, if you ask somebody out and they don't respond to you, it's good to stop there, right? <laughs> right? Like, if you keep asking somebody out and they're just not responding to you, like, let it lie. Like, that's pretty good advice. In business, if you, if you ask somebody for something, until you get a hard no, don't stop asking. And the reason is, it has nothing to do with any of us personally. People are just busy. Yep. After I sold DocStock, I pretty much went off. I mean, I, I, was, I was an email fanatic, right? If there was that guy, I was him. On email, six hours a day. You could email me at any time of day. You get a response back in a minute. Somebody in the company, you know, I'd be sending out emails to people in the company starting at 6 a.m. It didn't stop till 3 a.m. 
you know, just how I did all my business. I communicated. You know, I drove the people I was with crazy because I was always pulling out my phone, like always communicating. And after I sold DocSoc, I, I, I went cold for like six months, and I'm still kind of recovering. And I checked email <laughs> for half an hour once every other day. And I just figured, you know what? If it's important enough, somebody will find me. They'll find a way to get a hold of me. And it was actually, if, if there's anything I've done in my life that in the last couple of years, I mean, that has changed my life. It is like Neo taking the pill <laughs> in the Matrix, and you just, it's like, wow, like everybody is a lemming connected to a machine, and I'm finally free. <laughs> and so even now, I, I you know, I just. you've been responsive to, I mean, I emailed you, and you were pretty quick. Semi, you know, but you, you know there are times you probably had to email me a couple times, hey, will we tweet this, this is the article, not or whatever. Me. Not me. Right, you're, you're in the special filter, That's right. right? That's right. And so uh, you're in the brown category, short <laughs> filter. And so, <laughs> um, meaning, as someone that's looking for my advice and help, I'm really looking for folks that are going to kind of be persistent. Yep. So, you know, first email, it almost always gets ignored. And it's, it's just simply math. If, if every single person that emailed me asking for help or had a question I answered, yep. that would be literally my 50 hour a week full time job. There's probably you know, 40 to 50 unsolicited requests I get a week. Yeah. And so first filter, no response. Let's see who emails a second time. OK, second time, great, I'll respond. Send me some more information over email. 50% of people drop off of just as that. Yep. All right, now somebody's emailed me twice. They sent me more information on what they're doing, what they're working on. OK, I've got this event that I'm doing next month. Do you want to meet? Come by that event and say hi. Who's going to actually take the time to show up there? Now if they go through all those filters, then I'm going to say, you know what? Let's get together. I'm happy to. Because I know that this person is persistent enough and cares enough about what they're working on that they're going to keep following up. So I'm going to now give my time to that person. What that means for all of you in that situation is don't worry if somebody doesn't respond. Just keep following up. Right? Some of the biggest success that I've had professionally came from following up five, six, seven times when I just didn't hear back from a person or got a maybe yeah. until I finally got a yes. And so personally, people don't respond to you. Like, yeah, let it go. Professionally, don't stop following up with those contacts that are important to you until they give you a hard no. And then when they do, there's plenty of other contacts to go after. Yep. No, and I, I always tell students, polite persistence, right? Be polite. Obviously, you're deferential, you're respectful, but be persistent. And I always say that everyone owes you a response. Everyone owes you a response. I don't care how busy or how important they are, but it's incumbent on you to continue to email them because they don't owe you a response on your first email. Yeah. So I'm very consistent. And in that, that that's just real simple. Like, how many of you have ever sent, show of hands, how many of you have ever sent a cold email to somebody asking for some kind of response? All right, here's the wrong way to do it, right? Uh, wrong way. Subject line, Mr. Nazar following up on talk you gave. Body, hi, Mr. Nazar, I'm Jessica Day. I've been going to school, da -da 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 -da. two more paragraphs oh, yeah. about you. Yep. Paragraph five, I've got this thing that I would love to show you and talk to you about, right? End, or even worse, clearly, uh, cut and paste because the body text is a different font than the, the hi, Mr. Nazar, right? <laughs> hi, Mr. Nazar, New Times Roman, body text, Arial. <laughs> Done. <laughs> You're never getting a response from me again. <laughs> right response, subject line, I hate John's corduroy shorts too. <laughs> <laughs> One line, that joke you made about your dad was super funny. Would love if I could have three minutes of your time over email to share something with you. 99% response you'll get. So what's the takeaway? Be different. Yep. Be real. Add some personality into it. Don't be verbose. Short, fast, to the point. These are the ways to get folks that are busy and are successful to want to respond and engage with you. So I think the subject lines that work best, and don't do this with me, because I'll, I'll start to ignore them, but it's congratulations and thank you. Those work. I read those. I read everything, but I'll read those for sure. And I think just one thing to add to Jason's um, perfect email is 
put something in there of use to Jason. So, and I was thinking of you, and I saw this link, and whatever. Maybe he'll read it, maybe he won't, but showing that you really have applied some thought to what he said to the point that you can then extrapolate something he might want to read, that's pretty good. That's getting close to the perfect email. Um, we'll take the next student's question. In your online lectures entitled 21 Golden Rules for Entrepreneurship, you speak about a perpetual sense of urgency to find fulfillment in your life. How would you instruct a young person who is really unsure about their future but still wishes to achieve that type of fulfillment? How many people saw that talk, the 21 Golden Lessons? I'm surprised it's not more. That thing has been, that has made the rounds on the internet. That thing has been seen by a lot of people. It's very, very, if you haven't seen it, watch it. How many of you have seen Honey Badger? <laughs> oh yeah, see, if, I, if there was a Honey Badger <laughs> yeah, Next with time. a good voiceover in my talk, then, then it would have done great. So anyway, sorry, I just I stepped on your question. But. All right, what, what's your name? Reno. Reno? Yeah. Tell me your question again without reading it. Like, what are you use your mic, use your mic. Yeah. yeah. Just how, how would you instruct a young person who doesn't really know what it is that they want to do but still wants to find something that they're, like they're not sure what it is that they want to do yet? Yeah, so I, I don't know, I, it's a great question. I don't know what I want to do. I'm, I'm unemployed right now, right? I, you know, and I'm gonna figure out what to do next for the rest of my life. And that is the biggest privilege possible, right? To just have a little bit of time to figure out what you're gonna do. And so that's, that's a great thing right away. And it feels like the thing that causes the most anxiety probably for a lot of you. It's like, oh God, what's the rest of my life gonna be? The fact that you even get gift. to think about it and spend time on it is just the biggest blessing in the entire world. Yep. And so let's talk about the first part. I have a fundamental belief that folks that are the most successful have a deep sense of urgency. Meaning if you wanna get something done, you wanna do it now, right away. You know, it doesn't do any of us any good to say, oh, I want to start a business one day. That one day will, will inevitably become never. If you want to start a business, do it now. If you want to work in real estate, do it now. If there's something that's meaningful in your life that's worth pursuing, pursue it now. Because there is no later. You don't know what's going to happen. There's what's going to go on the rest of your life. Like today is the meaningful day in your life, right? Tomorrow, like yesterday happened. Tomorrow's a day away. Today is the meaningful time in your life. And so pursue the things that you want now. And so as far as not knowing what you want to do, that's great. I, I think that's the best thing, because it means it gives you time to jump in and try a lot of things. And so time is the biggest asset. If, if, if I could be back in your positions, where I was you know, a senior getting ready to wrap up, and I had the next decade of my life to try lots of different things, I, I would make that trade in a heartbeat. You know, and I did very well on DocStock. You know, a lot of people involved with the company did really well, but I would go back and trade places with, with any of you right now. And it's not because, oh, I need to be younger or any of that stuff. It's just, it's the, the next like five, six, seven years you're gonna spend exploring and figuring out what you wanna do and trying new things. It's just a super special, magical time of life and you're never gonna get it back. And so there's no right or wrong way to go about it, but just realize to enjoy it. Like there's, there's nothing that you can do that's, that's wrong. There's no wrong path you can take. Like that, that's the thing, you think like, okay, God, like there's all this pressure, I gotta make the right decision, I gotta, make, I gotta, I gotta go to the right grad school, I have to get the right job, I have to do the right thing. There, there is no right thing, right? There's just the path that you're gonna go on that's gonna lead you to the next path and the path after that and the path after that. And she's just jump in and enjoy the process. And you should probably end up doing the thing that you secretly want to do that scares you the most. All right, I'll repeat that. You should most likely be doing the thing that you secretly want to do that scares you the most. So let's just pause here for a second. I'm going to ask, you, I'm going to ask a favor of all of you. I want you to take 30 seconds, and I'm not going to ask anybody to stand up and share this. There'll be no financial reward for this one. <laughs> I want you to write down on a sheet of paper, I want you to write down the thing that you secretly want to do that scares you the most. I don't care whether there's financial reward involved in it. I don't care if it's, a, if it's meant to be your long-term career, just something you want to do. I want you to write down the thing that you secretly want to do that scares you the most. Just take 20 seconds and do this.
While you guys are doing that, I'll add an annotation there. One way you can start to push your boundaries is be a yes. So when somebody says, hey, do you want to go do so-and-so, instead of going, I don't know, just go, okay, let's go. As long as it's safe and legal, <laughs> safe and legal, just say yes. And then if you do it and you find out it sucks, you don't want to ever do it again, that's fine. You found that out. But all too often in life, we filter. We go, well, I don't know. I'm not sure about that. Just go, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. This break in the TMP lecture brought to you by just saying yes. <laughs> I said legal. It's, been, it's, it's worked for 5,000 years. Yeah. All well, right. We got 20 seconds. The thing, that, the thing that you secretly want to do that scares you, all right? I, I will make the case that whatever you wrote down is probably the most important thing that you should do in your life right now. And not for the outcome of what you'll achieve from it, but for who you will become in the process of having to go through it. I was pretty scared when I was in your situation running for student body president. I was not a particularly well-known or super popular guy or any of these things. I, I didn't do things to make myself publicly known on campus. I was very competitive. I didn't want to lose, right? And, and I, didn't, I didn't want to put myself in that position. And there have been plenty, there have been many more things in my life that I have gone after that I didn't get than things that I have gone after and I did get. But the couple big things in my life that I've gone after and got have more than made up for everything I, I didn't end up getting. And when I was 21, and I actually won the election, it taught me an, a really big lesson. And the lesson wasn't that, oh, I'm a good leader, or I can galvanize people, or I can win stuff. It taught me that if I can see something in my mind's eye, if I can see an outcome in my mind's eye, and I have enough belief that I can make it a reality, and I put enough effort in to make that happen, I can make the things in my head materialize in the real world. That's what I learned. And it doesn't work always, but it works sometimes. And I'll, I'll tell you very honestly, it's a genuine superpower I, I feel like I have. I feel like I have a superpower that most people don't, not everybody, but most, which is that I can see things in my head that don't exist, and I can manifest them into reality. And the case I will make to any one of you, and all of you, is that if you go after this thing that scares you, but that you really want to do secretly, you will end up developing that same superpower, whether or not you achieve your outcome or not. Because you'll realize, oh, hey, A, this isn't that scary, and B, it's actually achievable. And even if I didn't totally achieve it on the first time, on my second or third or fourth time, I bet I could. And it's going to be this thing you get to have with you the rest of your life. And again, when is the, the best time to go after it? Now. 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 Yeah. So I think you just hypnotized everybody in the room and everyone watching, including me. What do you want me to do? So, See? <laughs> so let's talk about that, because I think that's a great example of, of doing something you're frightened to death to do. You put yourself out there, again, as a joke, as a way to make money, as kind of a lark of like, yeah, sure, I'll be a professional hypnotist. Then you get a gig in front of hundreds of people, and you go, oh, crap. I'm now a professional hypnotist. You were all in. So you did it again. You got the same pattern in your career. You didn't call in sick. You didn't get somebody else to do the gig for you. You showed up, and you were a hypnotist. Talk about that for a minute. So I, I'm going to jump out. There's, I would, honestly, I would, without trying to be too self-promotional, I would say watch this video, The 21 Golden Rules of Entrepreneurs. I tell the whole story yeah. there. The, the point of the story is that the point, of the, the, the point of that story is that a lot of times in life, you have, to, you, know, you have to believe it before you see it, right? It's the opposite of critical thinking. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. No, you'll see it when you believe it, and the belief is in yourself. And so that, that is a very common trait of very successful people, which is that their belief in themselves precedes 
and supersedes the skepticism and doubt of others, right? There, there's really no logic that, there's no logic or there's no proof that really says any of you right now could start a, a billion dollar business, multi-billion dollar business. Yet, there are a lot of 20 year olds that are now doing that in the tech field. And so, I don't know that they're all that much more exceptional than any of you, but A, what they are doing is they're putting themselves in the game right now, today, and B, they probably have this characteristic where their belief in themselves supersedes the skepticism and doubt of everybody else around them. I do encourage you to listen to that story because I think you could have also been a professional comedian if you had wanted to. That story is freaking hilarious. Thank you. We'll take uh, the next student's question. Hey, Jason, I'm Nate. Nice to meet you, Nate. Um, my question for you, um, I read your article titled The Unintended Consequences of Startups, and I'm wondering, um, looking back at your startup, is there anything you would do differently to avoid the dark side, or is it inherent in starting a business? Got it. Great question. So I'm going to quickly summarize this article, and then um, I'll, I'll answer the question, Nate. So the, the, what this article is basically saying, it's, it's on the Wall Street Journal now. You can read it. The, the unintended consequences of startups is um, really how much, how taxing that experience was and how much I gave up. So here were the bullet points, right? When I started the company, I was probably as skinny as Nate. I was like 175 pounds, gained a lot of weight, 40, 50 pounds just from working late. My mom was sick and basically in the process of becoming an invalid. I spent a lot less time with her. I didn't see my friends for a year and a half. I worked 16 hours a day, and I basically just slept on the weekends to recover, and worked Sunday and slept on Saturday. Didn't really date or have much of a relationship for years. Uh, do you, does it have to be that mentally and physically and emotionally taxing? No. I, I tend to do things in extremes. I think I brought some of that on myself. I think a little bit was a sense of like, you know, look at me, like I can take on anything where it didn't have to be that way. But the, the overall point is that anything big that you want to go after in life, whether it's starting a business or your professional career or something you want to accomplish physically or a relationship that's really important to you, it comes at a price. And if you're willing to put in the price for the outcomes you want, you will, uh, you, will more, you will get the outcomes you want. But it's just important to know that if you want big things, they come with sacrifices. So don't expect to have a big life if you're not willing to make those personal sacrifices that come along with them. And, and anyone, the very simple thing I can say is, is anyone in your demographic that is starting and running a company is giving up a lot of things that you all have right now, which is time and freedom and social life and hanging out with friends and not worrying about what's going on in their future. And it's, it's a real trade-off. And if you want to go after those big outcomes, just be prepared for the fact that there is real personal <coughs> sacrifice. I don't know for sure if I didn't work 16 hours a day the first two years in DocSoc that we still wouldn't have led to a good success. But I wouldn't go back and change it and take the risk, right? We got it, I got in every day at 10 a.m. and I did not leave until 2 or 3 a.m. Monday through Friday, slept on Saturday, worked a half day on Sunday. And that was two years of my life. There are plenty of other folks that haven't done that and they've had success, but there are thousands and millions more people that didn't do that and failed. And so I just decided from the beginning, I am going to take out effort as a potential variable for failure. Right? Maybe my idea isn't good enough. Maybe I'm yep. not a good enough leader. Maybe market conditions will change. But there is no way myself and this team is going to look back and ever say, we did not work hard enough. And that came with you know, these unintended consequences that I didn't realize at the time. Now, having been through it once, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do things a little differently. right? I'm not going to require the office that they need to be there until 9 or 10 every night. I'm going to say, look, we're going to have to get these things done. Here are these objectives we need to hit. You manage your time. 
And if you can get these things done in eight hours a day, great, I doubt it. But however you want to manage your time, whatever you want to do, that's great, but you're responsible for these outcomes. I, I wasn't mature enough as a leader when I first started the company to know how to manage a company that way. And I, I think that's one thing that will change for me over time. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, one thing about your culture, because I did get to visit your offices on a number of occasions and meet some of the doc stockers, um, hard driving culture, but a very healthy culture. And what I noticed was a number of people would have two titles on their business card. They would have you know, marketing analysts, and then they have their side job. How did that come about? Was that just something where you said, look, I, I, wanna, I don't want to squelch your entrepreneurial spirit. I know that you've got side projects. Go ahead and promote those. In fact, I think one person had like a two-sided card. It was they were doing this thing, and then you flipped the card over, and they were doing something else. Yeah. Uh, one th a great piece of advice I got very early on from you know, someone that sold multiple companies, made hundreds of millions of dollars, was you know, be very generous with titles. You know, you're only going to have so much money at the beginning. There's only so much money you can pay people. But for especially for good people, be really generous with titles. And it's just part of a long list of cultural things, right? I, I made a lot of mistakes the first couple years of the company. I was too hard on people. I didn't say thank you. I didn't spend enough time like thinking or doing anything about culture. And in year five of eight, it really kind of started to change. And what became most important to me is I, I want to build a place that people just want to be at. Right? You want to build this work environment that's so fun, that's so exciting. You have so many good friends there that you want to spend your time there. Right? And so part of things that there's like the, there are the little niceties that make a difference. Right? So I would bring in a masseuse every month for the team. I would bring in someone to do yoga for the team every other week. You know, every Friday, we would break early and just have a keg, and people would hang out. Every, once a month, we would take a field trip somewhere. Like in school, I would, take, I would take the team to Magic Mountain, and we would go to Disneyland, and we would go rock climbing, and we would go to the beach, right? And those are all the, those are all the toppings, right? The, mil, the real meat of it was that we built a culture where whether you were 51 and had worked for 30 years in tech, or 21 and were interning for us, the best idea was going to win. There was total transparency in the company about what was going on, how much cash we had in the bank, what our key metrics were. People knew what the mission of the company was. They felt connected of how what they were doing today today was supposed to be part of the bigger picture. And people generally liked each other, right? We were really selective about who we hired. If there was someone that was, I thought was going to do a really great job but was kind of an a-hole, right. no. I'd rather take somebody that was going to learn and develop along the way, but just was a great person. You wouldn't have hired me, though. Right? <laughs> no, I would have happily hired you. <laughs> right? You could, anybody in our company could have, whether it was day one that you had been there or year six, you could call anybody at 3 AM at night, say, hey, I'm stuck on the side of the road 50 miles away, a tire blew out, and any single person in the company would get out of bed and go pick you up and do it with a smile on their face. And that was, that was the culture that we eventually built into, and that was a company that was important to us. And, and, that, and, and that's, what made, that's what made it special, right? A lot of what Intuit had ended up buying was, yeah, we had 50 million users. We had tons of revenue. We were a profitable company. But we had this team that was just dynamic. And they were awesome. And they loved working together. And it was lots of energy. Yep. Well, I started out by saying that you're a man. She proven it tonight. You missed game five, for God's <laughs> sake. I would have taken the tickets and let someone else do this interview. Come on. <laughs> so let's give Jason a very warm applause. Thank you. Thank you.